guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. In the next 15 minutes, this lecture is going to focus in on Supreme Court cases. Supreme Court cases that you need to know. I don't care if you're a kid in high school and you need to pass that end of the year exam, if you're in college and you feel like you're lost in your course, or if you just need to know. Supreme Court cases, maybe like 9, 10, 11, 12 court cases, you can handle that. So, we're going to break up this lecture into three categories of cases. First, we're going to take a look at early court cases that the federal government garnered strength from, that gave it a larger role in federalism. Second, we're going to take a look at court cases that favored government policies or laws over individual freedom. We'll call these um, limiting court cases. They're going to limit your rights. And last but not least, we're going to take your rights, oh yeah, baby, and we're going to expand them. We're going to make them more than they were before the court case. So giddy up, let's do that. I'm going to go grab my sack of uh, early strength cases and I'll be back. There we go, court cases. It's actually dog food. All right, early strength cases. First, um, let me give you the John Marshall idea. John Marshall is one of the early uh, Supreme Court justices who um, are go is going to be really responsible for these three court cases. And in class, when I teach this in high school, I always give him the middle name Schwarzenegger. I call him John Schwarzenegger uh, Marshall all year long. And of course, Schwarzenegger <laughs> is associated with strength. I mean, I have my jacket on so you can't see my bulging muscles and my rocks. So that, that imagery should work for you. Strength cases. Cases that are going to strengthen the role of the federal government. First, we're going to do a really quick definition. I'm going to take a piece of paper here, and I am going to hold it up. And in class, we do this as power. And we always start off by saying in our government, federalism, right? Power is divided between the federal government and the, and the, and the states, today 50 states, right? Um, and really what this is about, this court, court case, these three court cases, is about redefining federalism. So by the end of these three court cases, we're going to see that the federal government is going to have more power than the state governments. That's really for another lecture, but that's the concept. <laughs> Marbury versus Madison, Established Judicial Review. I can't help myself. I know that I have to explain that, but that's what you have to memorize, guys. Marbury versus Madison is a very early court case, I think 1803. Man, I hope I don't mess facts up. But nevertheless, this court case, the facts of this court case, like what happened, like the who and the what and the what, really don't matter. It's called the Midnight Judge Court Case, and it's really about power between Thomas Jefferson and uh, John Adams and the election of 1800 and judges and whether you can appoint judges at the last minute and blah, 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 who cares? Well, you might care and you should do further research. But nevertheless, this is really the first court case where the Supreme Court, the nine lifetime justices, are going to be examining something that occurred in the executive branch, in the legislative branch, which they're going to render a judgment on. In the original Constitution, there is no power that the Supreme Court has to declare laws or actions unconstitutional. Really, in checks and balances, they kind of got a weak hand, like they don't have a lot of power. So when they make this decision, Marbury versus Madison, and they rule that this appointment of the judges is not right, you can't do that, it's unconstitutional, it violates the rules. They are, in a sense, giving themselves the power of judicial review. They are setting the precedent, the idea, that they can do this. Sometimes in class I'll inject myself with steroids. Because that's what this court case does. It gives the court more power. So every court case I do now, and you go, well, why do you get to do that? You go, Marbury versus Madison established. He said it. Judicial review. So that's what that court case is. It's the first court case. It's where you start. All right, two other court cases, right? McCulloch 
Maryland versus Maryland. And this is a court case that gets lost a lot in kids' vocabulary because it's not current, it's a long time ago, it's old dead people, who cares? But in terms of like constitutional power and strength, it is an important court case. I call this court case, you can't tax your dad. And the con I'll tell you really quickly the facts of the court case. And we want to really get to the precedent so you can get that answer right. You understand why it's important. We don't get lost in details. But basically, Alexander, Hamil Alexander Schwarzenegger Hamilton, oh, you learned something already about that, um, is what we call the father of the National Bank. He advocated for a big economic kind of powerhouse bank for the federal government to kind of like rule over in a sense. And uh, he got Congress to pass that. He was a federalist. So up pops the National Bank and it starts to kind of pop around in the states and kind of spring up and start to establish itself. Well, it went to Maryland. McCulloch was the guy who ran the bank versus Maryland. Maryland, right, was like, no way! don't want you in my state. So if we go back to federalism, can I do that? Where'd he go? The power's getting smaller. And I ripped that. See how they, maybe this is the Fed power a little bit <clears throat> bigger than this piece. <clears throat> this piece here, if you can see that right there. Let's see if we can do this, right? So here comes the federal government. Watch, watch, this is the kit, right? Here he comes. Here I come. I'm the dad, right? Oh, going to stay here. The kid is going to tell the dad. Maryland is going to tell the federal government, I'm going to tax you. Wait, I'm going to tax you. This is ridiculous. Maryland tried to tax the national government, the bank, in a, in a way to kind of railroad it out of town to not make it welcome. And that's what this court case is about. Does a state in federalism have the power to tax the federal government? And really, we're looking at two pieces of constitutional language here. A, we're looking at um, the Elastic Clause. Um, is the National Bank constitutional in the first place? Remember the Elastic Clause, Congress shall make all laws necessary and proper. Is it necessary and proper to have a national bank? Is that law going to pass mustard? Remember, uh, remember Marbury versus Madison when, when we do judicial review on it. And number two, um, Supremacy Clause. I call it the Who's Your Daddy Clause. It's the part of the Constitution that says if there is a throwdown, if there is some jive going on, who wins that argument in federalism? And, and the Who's Your Daddy Clause, remember the kid analogy, says that the federal government is, in a sense, the more powerful entity. Um, is not absolute power, but is going to be garnered or gain preference if there is that kind of, you know, match between the feds and the states. So, the federal government wins that court case, right? Schwarzenegger, baby. We're going to strengthen the role of the federal government by kind of giving credence and judicial review to that supremacy clause. So I'll tell Maryland, who's your daddy? That's the concept, supremacy clause. And number two, the bank is constitutional. Necessary and proper is determined by Congress. So if the Federalist Congress said that the bank is necessary and proper, then it's necessary and proper. So yay for the federal government. If you're the states, boo for the federal government. Nevertheless, that's the concept. <laughs>
um, flowed between two states, I think New York and New Jersey, but I might get in trouble on that one. The federal government through the Interstate Commerce Act is going to be able to regulate that river. Their license is bigger, is better, is the one that is going to rule the day. So, say the court case is with me really quick and we move on. Marbury versus established judicial review, right? McCulloch versus Maryland, who's your daddy, right? Elastic clause, necessary bank, good for you. And Gibbons versus Ogden, again, who's your daddy? And the interstate commerce clause. So there we go, yay, we win. Now we're gonna go grab another sad sack of court cases. These are cases that are gonna take your rights, which are yay big, yeah, and gonna limit those rights. So let's go see if we can get that. My sack of cases. It's actually my laundry basket. All right, limiting cases. So I think we're going to do four for you. And again, you know, I'm really kind of focusing in on high school and things that I know are on tests and things like that. But nevertheless, these are these are all big court cases in American history. So we're going to start in I think 1856, right? So we're going to kind of jump ahead those other court cases early 1800s. So right before the Civil War in 1856. Uh, the country was having kind of this, you know, sectional struggle between the South and the North over really the issue of slavery and the expansion of slavery. Um, there were abolitionists who wanted to abolish slavery, like, you know, uh, Harry Tubman, John Brown, that's another lecture. But politicians were more interested in stopping the spreading of slavery as we went out westward, manifest destiny ideas, right? Um, and really, I don't want to get like, like too in-depth in this, but it's like an economic argument. They, don't, they want free labor out west and... I'm going off the train. So um, basically, um, as all of this was going on, um, there was a slave, Dred Scott. And Dred Scott was brought, uh, brought from his, from, uh, by his master from a slave state to a free state. And when he got off the plane in the free state, you know what that is? He started doing the happy dance. Why is he doing the happy dance? Because he thinks that he's in a free state and that he's free. That's the court case. Is a slave a slave only in slave states? Or is freedom almost automatic as soon as you get into free land? So um, the court has an opportunity here really to change kind of, you know, the configuration of the country. If Dred Scott, it's called uh, Scott versus Sanford, but it's called the Dred Scott court case. Um, if he wins, that's a huge win for abolitionists and, and, and uh, you know, all blacks and all people. So basically, this would nullify the Fugitive Slave Act. Like once you were in free land, you're free, baby, right? That it would draw a line between the North and the South, right? You're enslaved. Once you get here, you're free. Well, he lost that court case, right? We're going to take rights and diminish them. The court is like gangster. They're going to come out and they're going to go, slaves aren't citizens. Citizens don't get rights. Slaves are like property. So it's like if I have a watch on, that watch is about as free as Dred Scott when I go to another state. That um, basically African Americans have no rights. They are invisible. Man, that sucks. That's the court case. But the effects of that court case, and I always say slaves are property. That's how I memorize that court case. The effects of that court case are actually um, almost a win for slaves. I know it sounds ridiculous, but um, it's going to cause abolitionism in the North to grow even faster. I call it the stink thesis. Like when people smell that decision, that stinks, right? And stink doesn't stink until it's in your backyard. So as that court case travels into abolitionists and other people in the North's backyard, abolitionists like a fire is going to grow. And when it grows and it gets really hot, it's going to really lead us into the Civil War because they can smell the smoke in the South. <laughs> Second decision, another sad court case, is Plessy versus Ferguson. Big court case. Like, if you don't know this one, it's like, go home. Plessy versus Ferguson is a court case about the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, one of the largest amendments in the Constitution, was passed after uh, the Civil War during Reconstruction, and basically it is the Equal Protection and Due Process Clause. 
This is a complicated idea that I'm going to really try to simplify for you. The Bill of Rights is for the federal government. It protects you like a shield against the federal government, not the states. Remember federalism? Oh, federal and state power, fed power. The states are on their own in determining what laws they want and how they determine rights and they have their own constitutions and it sucks in the South. If you're a Southerner, I'm sorry, but it sucks. They have Jim Crow laws. They're basically segregating, they're separating, they're treating black people differently than white people. And the 14th Amendment states, no state shall deny its citizens equal protection nor due process of law. That you have to give people equal protection and that you have to give everybody the same due process, that I give you the same kind of trial that I give that character. Um, so Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy was a African-American. Um, he was in Louisiana. He got on a train. He got arrested. He went on the white train. It was called the Separate Car Act. And he is challenging that law in the Supreme Court. He's going, that ain't right. And that violates the 14th Amendment. So after being arrested for violating the Separate Car Act, right, Plessy is going to challenge that law in the Supreme Court, almost like they that 14th Amendment, like on his shoulders. Like he brings it and he's like, I got the 14th Amendment, right? I'm going to win. And remember, the referees, the judges doing judicial review, Marbury versus Madison established judicial review, are gonna, is going to look at this law, the Separate Car Act, and look at the 14th Amendment and make a determination whether the law violates the Constitution. Now, it's almost like watching, it's like when I think of this court case, it's like I'm watching like a, like a, like a sporting event, like a, like a baseball game, and I see the ball go to the right of the foul pole. And I'm like, that's not a home run. All right, and they're going to look at the play. Well, they don't do an instant replay in baseball, but if they did, you'd look at it, everyone's like, foul! And what does the uh, umpire say? Home run! They're going to take the words. Remember, no state shall deny equal protection. Separate is equal. That's what they say. Separate is equal. That it's the same if I have a black train and a white train. That they are equal, inherently equal. Therefore, we're not violating the words. What, are you kidding me? Right? This is the court case that guts the 14th Amendment. It's almost like the 14th Amendment is like a tiger. Right? It can walk around the South like a tiger just looking for something. Right? It's going to get some fangs. It's going to protect people. It's going to be there. And Plessy vs. Ferguson like takes its teeth out and cuts its paws off. So it's just like a lion with no teeth and no legs. It's not a scary lion anymore. So that is going to allow for Jim Crow to flourish. It's going to be decades and decades before we reproach that court case. And that is Plessy vs. Ferguson. Separate is equal. All right, two more limiting court cases, and we're going to keep going. So, Shank got shanked. Shank is the next uh, chronological court case, always on exam, something that you need to know um, about limiting rights. Um, it is during World War I, 1917, 1918, and Shank, um, Charles Shank, was a socialist, and he was against the American involvement and intervention in World War I for different reasons. He's a war protester, right, like the hippies in the 60s. So he is out there on the streets, right, giving out leaflets, handing out papers, right? Don't go to the war. Rip up your drafts. Don't do it. Don't go to war. War of imperialism, right? And he gets arrested. He gets off his little soapbox, right? And suddenly the popo cops are there and off he goes to jail. Under arrest, you can't say those things. And off to jail he goes. So this is a court case about the First Amendment and about whether it's absolute that you have the right to your freedom of speech, basically no matter what, or can the government come in and take that right, and like I've been doing with this lecture, limit it. And the court limits Mr. Schenck's rights. They basically allow for the arrest, that that's a constitutional arrest, even though he says he has freedom of speech. So the court comes up with a doctrine. A doctrine is like a rule. Like something that is going to last beyond this court case. So if there's other court cases, like um, they can look up to that doctrine, to that precedent, to that rule, and everybody knows what to do. It's called the clear and present danger rule. And what they basically say is they use an analogy. They say, look, if you're in a movie theater, right, just like I am right now, I'm going to sit down, eat some popcorn, watch my movie, and then I'm going to have a little fun. Fire! 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 Freedom 
of speech? The court says, no, that that is like, duh. If you do that, you're creating a clear and present danger. You know what's going to happen when you say those words, right? Everybody's going to get up, ah, run to the exits, right? And little Jimmy's going to get his head stepped on. It's terrible. Sorry, Jimmy. If your name's Jimmy, I apologize. But nevertheless, uh, the court says that that crosses the line. They're not going to eliminate the First Amendment. You're still going to be able to say maybe, you know, I'm against the war. But because Charles Schenck was actually telling people to violate the law, to not do the draft, that he was endangering the nation, right? So instead of Jimmy, Jimmy's the nation. And he's stepping on the nation's head. And he's slowing up the war effort. So um, that limits your rights. Other, you know, this is relevant today. If you're in a hate group, you shouldn't be in a hate group. Um, but they operate under clear and present danger. They can say really terrible stuff, stuff that make your skin crawl. But if they say something that crosses the line, that puts somebody in a clear and present danger, let's go get them, uh, that's where they're going to be under arrest. So usually on tests, they either um, ask the clear and present danger question or the concept that the court isn't eliminating all your rights. I can't come in during the war and go, what are you doing? Praying to Buddha? Can't pray to Buddha? Stop that. Plus, Buddhists don't pray to Buddha, but that's a different lecture, too, right? So we can't eliminate, like, you know, limit religion, those kinds of rights. But if it's in the national interest and it's a clear and present danger for the nation, um, then you can't say that. I mean, it's a different story whether or not what he was doing was a clear and present danger. Some people say no, that he was trying to save the country, that he was being political, that he wasn't yelling fire in a movie theater. He was standing up in the movie theater and yelling, oh, my God, there's not enough exits if there's a fire. But that's for another day. All right, we're going to do another court case, one more limiting court case. Let me just tie my shoe, and then we'll be ready for expansive court cases, and then you're going to want to go to bed. Koromatsu versus United States. Now, I hope that's not offensive to anybody. It's just the way that I teach it, because uh, if I do it with a Japanese dialect, and that's the worst Japanese dialect in the history of Japanese dialects, um, you should at least know that Koromatsu versus United States is about something about Japanese. And it is. It's about Japanese Americans and habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is embedded in the Constitution as your most kind of enshrined rights. It's, it's bigger than the Bill of Rights. It's your right basically to be left alone by the government unless you do something. So, you know, if a cop runs up to you, he's like, get in the car, you're going downtown. And your first question is, well, what the hell, what do I do? That's habeas corpus. They have to have, like, some answer, you know, you're accused of robbing a store, you're, you know, running from the scene. But if you're just hanging out and they do that, it's habeas corpus. So during World War II, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, there's like really like kind of a wave of like hysteria across the country. Think of like being an Arab American after 9-11, right? That people are looking at you like you're the enemy. You are like, dude, I was born here. What's going on? So Japanese Americans that were living specifically on the West Coast, hundreds of thousands of them, are being looked at as Pearl Harbor, they drop bombs, you're a bomb dropper. And the government under FDR, um, he issued an executive order, I think it's 4011, 4044, that doesn't matter, um, which basically took the Japanese American population in the West and um, interned them, moved them to the deserts of uh, Cali, Nevada, I think, and basically locked them up. Um, we, there's no torture involved, they're not in jail cells, um, but they are being removed from their homes and they're being put in different communities that are under lock and key, um, and that's messed up. And again, the court has the opportunity in Koromatsu versus United States to stop the government, to expand rights, and it drops the ball. It basically says that it's World War II, it's an emergency, I don't care, you're staying in the, in the, in the internment camps. Um, so that's a limiting court case, absolutely. Um, later down the road, um, Bill Clinton apologized to the Japanese Americans. I heard an NPR story the other day about Mr. Korematsu from his daughter. He passed away, and uh, she was, that's different. It's not on the exam. So, Korematsu. So let's just say our court cases, and then we're ready to move on. Dred Scott decisions, right? Slaves are property. Plessy versus Ferguson, separate is equal. Schenck versus United States, fire! Clear and present danger, speech limitations and Korematsu versus United States. World War II, internment camps, habeas corpus, oh my goodness, we're almost there, I'm gonna go get a sack of cases. They're in here, it's my school bag. 
All right, expansive cases. Let's take our rights now and let's start to move it in the other direction. Um, these court cases, most of them are called Warren court cases, Earl Warren being the chief justice. Um, so that might be important vocabulary for you, but giddy up, let's hit these four or five court cases. Your first one is, we got to change that, that Plessy decision. That's terrible. Um, in the 1950s, we have Brown versus Board of Ed. It is kind of a repeat of the Plessy case. Um, children are being sent to, not a train now, but to a black school in Kansas when there's a white school that is, that is close to their homes, and they are claiming 14th Amendment, right? No state shall deny equal protection. This time, the court gets it right. And they say separate is inherently unequal, that we are not creating equal schools, but we are treating black and white people differently, and that violates the 14th Amendment. So this is basically going to outlaw segregation, and it's going to begin the end of Jim Crow, the beginning of the end of uh, legal Jim Crow. So that was argued by Thurgood Marshall, who will later be on the Supreme Court, by the NAACP, who is a lobbying uh, organization for African Americans, and uh, that's an historic court case. Like, if you don't know Brown versus Board of Education, you probably shouldn't take the test, or, or and, you know, go to class, or, like, walk out of your house, or anything. So Plessy and Brown, if you do those together, that's a smart idea. All right, so these are kind of uh, court cases in the 1960s I'm approaching now that are basically for suspects of crimes. Most of these court cases, not all of them. So let's look at our suspect court cases. And these are harder to be popular with because we're not protecting the African-American child. We're protecting the potential murderer, killer, robber, burglar. But we're going to go under innocent until proven guilty and that these court cases are going to make sure that people who are supposed to be looked at as innocent are given due process and that their rights are being protected. So um, here we go. Let's do, uh, I love these court cases to teach. Uh, let's do Matt versus Ohio. That's kind of a cool court case. I call it the dirty old lady court case. The dirty little old lady court case. Uh, let me just give you the facts of the court case and, and get that precedent out. Um, it's a uh, court case where the police in Ohio, Matt versus Ohio, were looking for a suspect in a crime. So they went and they thought that um, the suspect was going to be at a relative's house, Miss Matt. So they're banging on the door. They want to come in the house. They want to find the suspect. Miss, not Miss Matt, the suspect. So Miss Mapp opens the door and the cops are like, we want to come in. We think you have the suspect. And Miss Mapp is like, oh no. You're not coming in my house without a warrant. It's Fourth Amendment. So the police flash a phony warrant, and they rush, bum rush, and come in the house. So Miss Warren holds on to the bad warrant, and lo and behold, the suspect's not there. So I think that the cops probably were a little bit upset. I don't know, you know, truly why. But they start digging through her house and through, like, the basement drawers and just junk. And they end up finding... Warren dirty little old lady porn. Not pornography of little old ladies, but just pornography that was considered at the time to be legal pornography, obscene pornography. I'm not going to use the green screen to do the pornography thing. But nevertheless, she's arrested for these obscenity charges for having that in her home. And now she's going to claim that they didn't have a warrant. They can't come in without a warrant. And, and the Fourth Amendment really doesn't address this. It doesn't say, what if? What if the cops don't have a warrant and come in and find the dead body with a big steak knife sticking out of it. What are they supposed to do? Just like, oh, didn't have a warrant, sorry. You might want to clean that up, right? So um, this is an expansive court case because what they do is they say, yeah, you're not allowed to use the evidence. We're going to punish the police. If you don't have a warrant and you go in someone's house and you find the knife, the fingerprint, the dead body, the or not, whatever, it is excluded from trial. Hence the exclusionary rule. So Mapp versus Ohio, and I know you've seen that in Law and Order, right? You've seen it. That is the exclusionary rule. Taking the Fourth Amendment, which says you have to have a warrant, and expanding it. So now, if you don't have a warrant, and you find the dirty evidence, you can't use it. There's some exceptions to that, but that's for AP. I can't do Nix versus Williams, okay? Or U.S. versus Liam. All right, moving on. Angle. Let's do really direct ones, because I'm looking at the time, and I'm killing here. Too long. Angle versus Vitale. I always kind of do that. Engel versus Vitale is the Supreme Court decision that said that school prayer, or at least school-sponsored prayer on intercoms morning announcements, violated the First Amendment of government organizing religion. This is the church and state idea. 
uh, is called the Establishment Clause. And basically it says the government can't pass laws which establish a religion. And by saying, let's bow our heads to God, even though 98% of you might believe in God, we protect the children who don't believe in God or whose parents are atheists or Hindus or Buddhists who are uncomfortable with that, or even Christians who don't want the school coming in and doing religious stuff. So you can disagree, but that is Engel versus Vitali, right? No school prayer. Sponsored prayer. You can pray in school. You can do it like this. Watch. There, done. All right, just no school sponsored prayer. Um, Miranda is a great court case that's on the exam a lot. Um, you know Miranda already. I can start and you can finish. You have the right to, you said it, remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford, we could do this, you know that, right? That idea that when I arrest a suspect, right, they have the right to remain silent, Fifth Amendment, right, cover your mouth. It doesn't say you have the right to know you have the right to be silent. It says you have the right to be silent. So before Miranda, the cops could just question you forever. You could say, I don't want to talk. And the cop would go, well, we going to talk. And you had to just remain silent, right? Miranda wasn't maybe the smartest uh, tool, in the, the sharpest tool in the shed. So when they kind of just kept on, Mr. Miranda, why'd you do it? what you do? Eventually he spills the beans. And now the Supreme Court's going to come in and say, we're going to take that Fifth Amendment, using the 14th Amendment, Selective Incorporation of Due Process, and we're going to expand it. So now it means the police are going to tell you you have the right to remain silent, right? And once you say, I don't want to talk, the questioning stops, right? Later, that's going to be expanded upon. Gideon versus Wainwright is going to give you a lawyer if you can't afford one. That's where the, if you, you know, can't afford one comes from. And there's also an Escobedo versus Illinois, which you've seen on Law and Order. Once you ask for a lawyer, right, they got to get the lawyer. So Miranda's the big one, though, right? Just remember the Miranda warnings. The last court case that we're going to do for you um, is Tinker. I've seen this on lots of exams. So Tinker is a Vietnam court case. It's about a student who was wearing a black armband um, to protest the Vietnam War, and the uh, principal did not want that happening. So basically she said, you take the armband off or you get out. And he said, I'm not taking the armband off. She said, get out. And he is saying that this is a First Amendment right, my freedom of speech, that if I'm against the Vietnam War, I have the right to, to, to express that in school. He's not wearing a shirt that says, like, curse word war. He's wearing an armband. And the court is going to side on the side of students and say that you are allowed symbolic free speech in school. So if you want, tomorrow, you want to wear a big pink headdress and say that that is protesting a war, I guess you can do that. Just make sure it's not too big and it blocks the kid from behind you. So I think that's it. That's judicial review. That's a lot of court cases. Remember, you have your strength court cases, right? They're scrolling up on the wall right there, right? The Marshall Court, Schwarzenegger, baby, yeah. You got your cases that do that. Look them up at the wall. Can you name what they are? Do you know what they are? Are you ready? Right? Court cases that limit rights. And finally, the other way. Look at the ones that we just did. Right? Can you do the dirty little old lady? Do you know what Brown does? What about Miranda? I'm going to Mirandize you if you don't know it. Okay. Good for you. We've done a lot of court cases. So make sure you study up where attention goes, energy flows, and you should be all good. So... We'll see you next lecture, guys, right? I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm going to go to bed.